A Mucky Business with Tim Farron. Hello and welcome. I'm Tim Farron and this is the show where you get to hear from a Christian politician about how they live out their faith in the mucky business of politics. You might think that politics is tainted by compromise and sin. I think you'd be right. But then again, so is everything else. And I think Christians should be praying for their brothers and sisters who are playing their part in politics in an informed way. Today, we're talking about passionate and sometimes dangerous campaigning. How do you make political change happen, especially when it's unpopular or even risky? Our guest this week is Lord David Alton, who in the last week has been sanctioned by China for his frequent campaigning on the issue of the human rights abuses going on there. He's a Christian, he's an independent peer, and a keen advocate for religious freedom and for the Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang. He's recently been part of a campaign to change the government's position on the issue of genocide. What he proposed was that the High Court should decide whether there was a genocide or not, and if there was in a particular country, then that would prevent the UK potentially trading with that country. He ended up with a compromise, and the government agreed to allow a House of Lords committee made up of retired judiciary, who would also instead make that adjudication about whether there was or wasn't a genocide. Of course, then, after that, the government would have to decide whether they wanted to proceed with a trade deal or not. But that's real progress all the same. But before we speak about all that, Cara Bentley has a roundup of some of the news this week. Well, Scottish party leaders are having their first TV debate this week as campaigning for the Scottish elections is on, although they will not be joined by Alex Salmon's new Alba party. But you may have seen that Scottish church leaders have won a hearing that said it was unlawful for the Scottish government to close churches for the public gatherings for the lockdown that came in in January. A judge decided it was disproportionate in comparison to other areas of society as court cases were going ahead and churches were often safer than than places like supermarkets and seen by many as just as essential. It didn't have huge practical implications as churches are now open anyway, but it does mean there is now form for the closure of churches and other parts of lockdown to be challenged. Now in England, rules have now relaxed, meaning many people are visiting family over the long bank holiday weekend for the first time in ages outside. Last Easter, you may remember how churches had only just started working out how to use Facebook Live. Pastors appeared upside down and the sound was out of sync. This Easter is weirdly the moment that many churches will decide to add something back into their ecclesiastical menu. So some are doing outdoor singing, adding in another meeting perhaps during the week or simply gathering for the first time in their building again. Tim, are you going to church physically this weekend? I am. I did last weekend and we will next and in a very socially distanced and responsible way. It will be fantastic to be alongside alongside the rest of my my church family. Um, But the key question this week, Cara, is have you put up your Easter tree yet? No, me neither. But according to Sainsbury's, searches for Easter trees on their website has gone up by 977 percent. Now, the cynic in me says that a 977 percent increase on a very small number, still isn't all that huge. But stick with me, because we're trying to make news here. And from a somewhat higher base, I suspect, Marks and Spencer say that demand for Easter eggs have risen 86%, and that sales on its wider range of Easter products has shot up by 3,000%. So after the disappointment of last Christmas, when family get-togethers were cancelled at almost the last minute, has Easter become the new Christmas? Well, as of this week, People can spend time in groups of up to six people outside. And so some of those postponed family events can now take place on that lovely new garden furniture that you've bought. And according to Asda, there's been a 400% increase on sales of those items. And that is enough statistics. In this country, in normal times, Easter isn't anything like as big a deal as Christmas. In part, I suspect that's because the Easter story is a lot harder to sanitise than Christmas is. Of course, Christmas is all fairy lights, Father Christmas, schmaltz and commercialism, but the nativity does get a look in because, well, babies and angels and guiding stars, it's a fairly cost-free concession to Christianity on the part of the world. But Easter, well, it's eggs and bunnies and the arrival of spring because, let's be blunt, the grisly crucifixion of a man isn't cute. You can't dress that story up. It's ugly and it's threatening. 
But the Easter message is the Christmas message. That man dying on the cross is that baby. In fact, dying on that cross was the very reason that baby was born. That baby was born to die for you because you need a savior. The fact that Jesus was to die is why the angel celebrated, why his mother conceived, why wise men traveled vast distances to honor him. Terrible link here, but talking of traveling vast distances, we brace ourselves here in the Lake District for the arrival of thousands of visitors this weekend because people are eager to get out and to travel. But I think they are even more hungry for social interaction and for something to celebrate. And Easter gives them that opportunity. In my experience as a Christian with a modest public profile, Easter and Christmas are the two times of year when the media will tolerate you saying something vaguely religious. And the pandemic is the event that has also prompted many to ask the big questions. What's life all about? Why are we here? Am I answerable to anyone except me? So I hope and I pray that Easter will be a much bigger deal this year and that through the get togethers of friends and family and the slightly contrived festivities, there will be real opportunities for the gospel to be shared in person and through every form of media. After all, Easter is a series of events documented in history. If they are true, and I believe that they absolutely are, then everything changes. If Easter really happened, then there is a God and we know his name. The church has done much this year to serve our communities and to bring people together. Let's pray that this year's bigger emphasis on Easter might lead to a seeking of understanding by some as to what it's all about. A Mucky Business with Tim Farron. Well, this week on the show, we're talking about how change can come about as a result of campaigning. Here to discuss this with us is Lord David Alton, who recently led a campaign to get the UK to limit trade with countries that are found to have conducted human rights abuses, namely China. His amendment persuaded enough members of the House of Lords to send it back to the Commons. But it was a compromised version which was passed by MPs, which I'm sure he'll tell us about in a moment. David was a Liberal MP for 18 years before he became an independent member of the House of Lords. At some point during those many years, he rediscovered his personal faith in Jesus. David Olson, it's an absolute pleasure to have you with us. Good morning. Good morning, Tim. It's a pleasure to be with you. Well, let's start some time ago. Uh, a fascinating story. You were very nearly the shortest termed MP ever, but you hung on. Tell us what happened. I was elected the day after the Callaghan government lost the vote of no confidence and the by-election in Liverpool, which in which I was standing, was taking place the following day. Happily, I was elected, but of course the government had collapsed, so a general election was called the night before my by-election. I had to take my seat the following Tuesday. I made my maiden speech within two hours of arriving, just on the off chance that I wouldn't get re-elected. I didn't want to be one of those trivial pursuit questions for the rest of my life, you know, the man who got in but never even got to speak. Happily, the people of Liverpool sent me back again four weeks later. But yeah, I was the shortest lived and the youngest member of parliament for the 1979 parliament. What an amazing time. Now, given the topic of this show and, and, and of, uh, of this podcast in general, uh, your faith is of great interest to us, of course. What was your faith like at that time? Well, I, my faith came really with my mother's breast milk. My mother was from the west of Ireland. Her first language was Irish, not, not English. Married my dad, who was a desert rat. I was the typical kid off the council estate. I didn't have a political upbringing, but there was a lot of talk in our home about all the things that had gone before, whether it was the injustices in, in Ireland or the terrible things my father had seen. And he'd rather lost his faith, blaming mm. God for some of the tragedies that he'd encountered, not least the death of his own brother who was in the Royal Air Force. And we would talk about a lot about this. I was fortunate in that the schools I went to were very affirmative of my faith. I got involved in social activism. And when I went up to Liverpool as a student, it came with me. Now, it comes and goes. I mean, I, over the years, I've, uh, I've, some people would say, what kind of Christian are you? I'd say a failed again Christian, because obviously mm. I, I stumble along. I, it is not a, a once in a lifetime moment and never to be changed, never to be challenged, never to doubt. It may be for some people, but it hasn't been for me. It's something that's incremental and that has stuck with me throughout my life. But there have been moments where I've 
not been as as committed perhaps in 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 taking my faith as seriously as I should but I think that's true for most of us in our in our journeys but when things have gone wrong in my life I've never been in any any doubt about uh, who's there to help me through and that's obviously been a, a major uh, influence in your in your life um in in first in the house of commons and then in the house of lords and it's one of the reasons why you ended up um as a as an independent in the house of lords somebody who wanted to be free to express your conscience Yes, that's one of the reasons, although, as, as you know, and you've experienced this yourself, I, I mean, I've had the, the challenge of not being able to square the circle with, with my former party. I never joined any other party, but and I'd been attracted as a boy into Joe Grimmon's Liberal Party. They had six members of the House of Commons and three or four percent in the opinion polls. So if I'd wanted a career in politics, it wouldn't have been a very smart move. But I, I happen to think that, he, that Joe Grimmon and the Liberals stood in the right place. And I look back at their antecedents and a great hero of mine, though I see he's being defenestrated sometimes in some quarters these days, was William Ewart Gladstone, mm. who was highly motivated, of course, not just by his politics, but by his faith. And I felt drawn into public political life in the sense that I stood for the council in, in Liverpool while I was still a student. Uh, and I, I, I was elected uh, when I was 21 and represented a neighbourhood that was incredibly uh, poor. There were homes still had no inside sanitation, running hot water or bathrooms, half the streets still had gaslight. So I cut my teeth in what I often call the university of adversity. And mm. so my, my faith was part and parts, parcel of who I was, but it was also part and parcel of the people whom I came to represent as well in their lives. So I interacted with people and I could see that as a way of motivating me, my faith wasn't purely a private matter. And one issue that had defined me even while I was at school, I collected petitions against the Abortion Act because I felt this was the taking of the life of a human being. Now, in, the, in Joe Grimmon's Liberal Party, this was a matter of conscience, and it remained a matter of conscience. Indeed, the author of the 1967 Abortion Act, David Steele, who remains a good friend, close friend of mine, David insisted it should be a matter of conscience, that even though we disagreed about the substantive question, this was a matter that each person could be able to make up their own mind about. And that changed when the party decided it would make it a matter of party policy. And I didn't feel I could square that circle. So I stood down from the Commons in 1997. I left party politics. And to my surprise, John Major uh, offered me a, a peerage. I fought long and hard about it. It didn't come with the condition of having to cross the floor or join any other party. And that's the reason why I sit as an independent in, in the Lords and have done for over 20 years. And as we've looked at your time in the House of Lords, it's been marked from my perspective um, by a consistent record of campaigning for those people who are most marginalised and whose plights very often are unsung uh, in the uh, around the world. And in particular, recently, your campaign for people who are persecuted and indeed worse has led to something rather peculiar happening. So. Uh, David, you find yourself being sanctioned by the Chinese government. Tell me how that has come about. It's a strange thing because if, as a student, I, I taught refugee children English as a volunteer over my summer vacations for a couple of years. And some of those families were families that had fled from Mao's China via Hong Kong. And the daughter of one of those I taught is, is my goddaughter to this day. So I've always, I have a great love of China, of Chinese people, um, and of Chinese culture and civilization, but I don't have a great love of the Chinese Communist Party and the things that they have done. You only have to look back at the terrible depredations caused by Mao Zedong through the Cultural Revolution or the so-called Great Leap Forward, and millions upon millions of people died in that. And when I see what they're trying to do in Hong Kong, where they've um, taken so many of the many of the, the the great freedoms and liberties that that wonderful city had enjoyed under so-called two systems one country. When you look at what's the threats that are being made to Taiwan, what happened in Tibet, which I, I visited, or now in Western China, in Xinjiang, to the Uyghurs, where there's clearly a, a genocide underway, I felt compelled to raise this question in the House. I'm vice chairman of the all-party parliamentary group on the Uyghurs, and I've taken evidence from some of those who have escaped from Xinjiang, and I've heard some terrible, terrible things that have happened to people, including systematic public rapes, the, um, uh, the, the, the separation of families, um, 
the re-education of over a million people, the use of people as slave labor. And I, how could you not do something? I, I have the privilege, as you do, of being able to speak in Parliament. And I took the advantage to raise this issue on the trade bill and said that we should not trade with genocidal states, simple as that, and that there ought to be a mechanism for determining what is and what isn't a genocide under the terms of the 1948 Convention on the Crime of Genocide, which was a treaty that was established as a result of the Holocaust. Mm. The word genocide was coined by Raphael Lemkin, a, a Polish Jewish lawyer, and who said, we mustn't allow these things to happen again. But Tim, on all our watches, whether you think of places I visited like Darfur or Rwanda, or you think about Bosnia, mm. uh, and now you think about the Rohingya or the Uyghurs, or the Christians of Northern Nigeria, genocide is being played out again all over again. And the world is often indifferent and seems the interna international institutions seem to have been subverted and incapable of stopping it from happening. A Mucky Business with Tim Farron. We're talking about campaigning with Lord David Alton. How do you make political change happen? Well, David, the potential now for real change to have been made to happen by your campaigning and you drawing people from all political backgrounds together to support a compromised version of your amendment, that potentially could make a huge difference. When you are trying to draw people together from across the uh, party political divide, do you think it helps that you sit as a crossbencher? It, it does in some ways, Tim, but even during my, my time in, in the Commons, uh, even when I served as, as the Liberal Chief Whip, I, I had this, the job of trying to bring two political parties closer together during the mm. period of the Liberal SDP alliance. <laughs> so I hope that I've instinct, got the right instincts to try and draw people together, not to, to be sort of egotistical about these things. And, and it, it was an amendment I tabled, but it became the all-party genocide amendment. And in the House of Lords, some of them, senior members of the Conservative Party, mm. got up, spoke in favour of that amendment and then voted against their party whip. For 11 former government ministers voted for it in the House of Lords. And then in the Commons, Sir Ian Duncan Smith, the former leader of the Conservative mm. Party, supported it, along with Jeremy Hunt, the former Foreign Secretary from, from the Conservative benches, and of course, all the opposition parties. So 300 members of the House of Commons voted for the amendment. It came within 11 votes at one point of of uh, going through in the Commons, mm. majorities of over 100 in the House of Lords. So there's been an argument about this. There is a so-called compromise, but it's not the end of the argument. It never is in Parliament. Incrementalism is the way forward. You achieve what you can in a yeah. particular bill and you don't go away. You come back again and again until you see the change you want. I've mentioned Wilberforce, a great Christian campaigner. He never became a even a party, party leader, Tim. He <laughs> never became a... a government minister, but he made a difference. After 40 years, he ended the slave trade, not by himself, but through an alliance, a coalition. You think of people like Thomas Clarkson, who threw in his divinity studies at Cambridge and became the principal organiser of the campaign. You think of the Quaker ladies who formed the first committee against slavery. You think of uh, Granville Sharp, the lawyer who threw, his, threw in his talents, or Oido Equiano, the escaped slave, who was willing to speak around the country and tell people about what it was like to endure the, the horrors of that trade. So alliances and coalitions have got to be brought together across political divides and mm -hmm. you choose a cause. And I'm much more interested these days in looking at what people's causes are rather than their partisanship. And I think you get to the point where left and right become less interesting than right and wrong. So is it right to trade in things that have been made by Uyghur slave labor? Is it right to turn a blind eye to what is happening to Christians in northern Nigeria? Is it right to, for us to give £800,000 each and every single day on average in aid to a country like Nigeria or £3 billion over 10 years to a country like Pakistan, where we see freedom of religion or belief being honoured only in the breach day by mm. day? And minorities, doesn't matter which faith they come from, but minorities, whether they're Christian, Muslim, um, Buddhist, Hindu, Jewish, if they're being, if their rights are being violated under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we have a duty to speak out and to use things like our aid programmes as leverage to bring progress in their lives. David, what keeps you going as a Christian when a campaign is unpopular or even detrimental to you, or if you find that people just aren't catching on? How do you, how do you cope? 
Well, I, I think one of my favorite characters from the New Testament is Barnabas, because even his name means son of encouragement. And it's people who encourage me, Tim, to just keep on going. Uh, and there are days when you, you wonder, are you making any difference? You feel like Sisyphus, who pushes the boulder up the hill, and it's always <laughs> seems to be coming back down on you. But you stick on in there because you little things often happen with the life issues. Um, mm. They're very unpopular. And you say to people, well, I, I think it's wrong to take the life of an unborn child. And someone will say to you, well, it's my right to do that. And I say, well, I, I don't think it's ever our right, but I understand the arguments. And you try to grapple with the, the, the reasons why people think as they do, and you try to move them along. And sometimes people change their minds. And sometimes someone will, well, someone will tell you, I didn't go ahead with the abortion as a result of what you said. And I, the Jewish rabbi who said the person who saves a single life saves the world was right. And that can be an inspiration. You might not change everything, but at least you can change something. Um, politics, I think the show is, is called, it's not, it, it's a, a mucky business, but actually I'm not, I don't know that it is a mucky business. I think it's a very high calling. And just because some of the players have mucky or dirty hands, it doesn't mean to say that the, the calling of politics is, 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 is mucky or dirty. It's a very high calling. Aristotle, the father of democracy, said that shame attaches, ADOS, he said, shame attaches to the person who refuses to play their part. And when I look and I visited countries like North Korea, when I look at situations there, I count my blessings. I realize how fortunate we are to enjoy the freedoms and the privileges and liberties that we have. And I think the, the challenge for us is to decide how to use those things in our own small ways, even if it's only just writing a letter to a member of parliament and saying, what can you do about Leah Sharibu, the schoolgirl who was abducted uh, four years ago and has been in the hands of Boko Haram ever since. What can you do about the 1,000 Christian and Hindu girls who are abducted every year and forcibly converted in Pakistan, some as young as the age of 12, forcibly married? What can you do about the military junta in Burma that's illegally taken power there? What can you do about the Uyghurs or, or the Rohingyas? And don't wring your hands and say, oh, there's nothing I can do. There's something all of us can do, uh, even the smallest actions. It was Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the Protestant theologian, who was executed by the Nazis, who warned about believing that we were unable to affect change. He said, not to speak is to speak, mm. not to act is to act. So I think he throws the gauntlet down to us over these these decades that in our own time in our own generation that we've got to use the opportunities we have well david you too encourage and challenge us by your persistent campaigning on these issues and championing the rights of, of groups of people who many people uh, weren't aware of and then drawing our attention to the need for us as a country as a democracy uh, to put our morals at the heart of our trade policy so personally i'm hugely encouraged Encouraged by you and grateful to you for everything you continue to do. More strength to your elbow, and we hope to speak to you again soon. Thanks so much, David. Thank you, Tim, and the feeling's pretty mutual. So thank you for having me on the on the show. This is your chance to ask me anything about being a Christian in politics. It could be ethical, political, or personal. This week we've got a question from Samuel. As a Christian and a politician, who do you think should be responsible for supporting those with disabilities? Should it be the state, the church, charities or everyone? Well, it's a great question. I think the answer to the question is certainly not nobody. So if we've got a responsibility to support people uh, with differing needs, whatever they might be, then how is that exercise? I think that actually then becomes more of a political question than a theological one. Because if we, as individuals, if I, for example, have a responsibility as a Christian to support people with disabilities and uh, indeed other people who have additional needs, then how does that um, take place? How does that happen? And I think I do have a responsibility as a Christian to support others. Do I do it individually? Yes, I can. Do we do it as a community? Yes, I think we should. Does the state sometimes act as the means of the community acting? And I think the answer is yes. So by us paying our taxes, which I always think are subscription charge for living in a civilised society, by paying the taxes and therefore supporting people through their 
um, their additional needs, that is a way of exercising, in my view, uh, my faith in practice. Obviously, as a politician, as a member of parliament, I spend an awful lot of my time fighting the corner of people living with disabilities and their loved ones, particularly through things like the PIP payments uh, through uh, the benefit system and having to argue people's corner. Not always the case, but sometimes people with disabilities are very vulnerable and aren't always able to fight their own corner quite as strongly as they would want to. And so I think it's my responsibility as an MP, but also just as a run of the mill Christian to fight the corner of those people who are in need. The other thing this reminds me of Samuel, I mean, if anyone has ever heard me tell my story about what got me involved in politics, it was watching Cathy Come Home, the uh, famous Ken Loach play from the 1960s, repeated in the 80s. Otherwise, I wouldn't have seen it because I'm not that ancient. But in any event, the Cathy Come Home story is obviously about a young couple who end up becoming homeless. And the focus is particularly on the young woman, Cathy. And you feel absolutely heartbroken for them and for their plight. But what angered me and what got me involved in politics in the first place was the way that people in power were indifferent to Cathy's plight and her need. And that's what I think we as Christians need to remember. We should be people who don't just care a little bit about people in need. We should actively go out of our way to fight their corner and never let them drop, never do to anybody in need with a disability or any other need what those people in officialdom did to Cathy in that film. And as there won't be an episode next week, here is a bonus question from Evan. Hi, the government recently introduced a police and crime bill. How does your Christianity shape your approach to justice? Well, given the furore over the uh, police and sentencing bill the other week, it's a good thing to ask a politician what they think about justice. Well, first of all, one of the things we should be praising God for daily is that he is the source of all justice, that uh, evil does not um, happen unpunished and that uh, goodness will prevail. That's something to celebrate every single day. But in our world here today, how do we approach justice? Well, we should seek to make sure that it is done. Often people will deride uh, the Bible because of the, uh, the, 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 the edict to um, have an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. It's important to remember, of course, that an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth means no more than an eye for an eye, no more than a tooth for a tooth. In other words, it's about making sure that justice is proportionate. It isn't excessive, that punishment fits the crime and no more. And we should be thinking about restoration of those people who commit crimes as well. I think in a free society, uh, and this is why I voted against that uh, bill, a free society, we should permit people to peacefully protest and shouldn't be expecting to lock people up for expressing a view different to the one held by the government. You know, when all said and done, we as Christians are a minority group and we therefore have it in our interests, um, I think, to defend the rights of other minorities to speak, even if we don't always agree with them. Well, if you'd like to ask me a question, please email farron at premier.org.uk. Well, as we come to the end of the show, I'd love it if you'd join me just for a moment in prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the work of Lord David Alton and for his passion and concern for marginalised, oppressed, persecuted people of all faiths around the world. We in particular pray for the Uyghur people in China, and we pray that they would be liberated from persecution, that you would stop the uh, genocidal behavior of the Chinese regime, that the bravery of people like David standing up to them and seeking to ensure that our government uh, does not just freely trade without a, a moral core to uh, those agreements, uh, that that work will lead to a liberation, a better quality of life for those people who are currently persecuted. Uh, we pray for all those in the House of Commons and the House of Lords that uh, we would be considering the decisions that we make, understanding at all time that we are answerable to you, Father God, and that you are the one who cares for the orphaned, uh, for the widowed, for those who are persecuted. And we pray that you would give us a heart to care for them also. And we also pray as we face this Easter time and we look forward to the festival that is to come, that the heightened um, significance of Easter in the minds of many people this year 
would be an opportunity for the gospel to be spoken and to be heard far more widely than normal and that millions would come to put their trust in the Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, next week, we'll be taking an Easter break, but we'll be back with a new episode on Tuesday, the 13th of April. I'm Tim Farron. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you.